From the moment you're a child, you're introduced to the idea of spatial dimensions. A dot has zero dimensions, a line has one dimension, a plane has two dimensions, and a cube has three. But what goes in between? Well, in between each of these numbers lie beautiful objects known as fractals. And to help us understand this concept, I'd like to start with a question. How long is the coastline of Britain? Simple, use Google and search how long is the coastline of Britain? Well, according to the CIA fact book, it's 12,000 kilometers. But wait, the World Resources Institute says 20,000 kilometers. And the Ordnance Survey, a UK mapping agency, says it's 31,000 kilometers. What is going on here? Well, while I'd like to think it's British propaganda to make their coast larger, each of these sources used a different unit of measure. But why such drastic difference? Well, as we know, coastlines aren't perfectly smooth. The more you zoom in on a map, the more detailed its edges become. So when you use a unit of measure that's too large, you're essentially ignoring parts of the coast. So if we use 100 kilometer units, we get about 2,800 kilometers. Enhancing our accuracy to 50 kilometer units, we get 3,400 kilometers. And as our unit of measure gets smaller and smaller, the coastline of Britain tends to infinity. What? But all we're doing is increasing accuracy. If we increase the accuracy of pi, it'll never drastically increase in size. The number always stays between three and four and its boundary only gets smaller and smaller. So how is this different to a coastline? Well, the difference is how we're increasing accuracy. With pi, we're simply adding on digits which get smaller and smaller. This series will eventually converge to a constant value as we'll never get a value large enough to change the previous digits. But with a coastline, we're actually multiplying the entire perimeter by a constant that's greater than one. So every time we lower our unit of measure, the perimeter gets larger by a factor of itself. The amount we're adding is increasing every iteration as opposed to with pi, which is decreasing. This is the coastline paradox, which is the counterintuitive observation that the coastline of a landmass doesn't have a well-defined length. In fact, with theoretically perfect measure, we'll always end up with an infinite length. So here we have a shape which has finite surface area, but an infinite length. We can't really describe this through a one-dimensional line, and its properties don't fit with 2D objects. So the coastline of Britain lies somewhere in between. And this brings us to the idea of a fractal, which is some curve with infinite detail, and sometimes self-similar. Now, I want to put a disclaimer here that there's no single strict definition of a fractal. Some authors require self-similarity, and others don't. But for the purpose of this video, and my chosen definition of dimension, we're just going to be looking at self-similar fractals, which repeat the same pattern infinitely across different scales. To demonstrate this, I'll give you five seconds to look at this line. You didn't know this, but I lied, and it's actually a circle. You see, when you zoom in on a non-fractal shape such as a circle, it'll eventually appear straight, but on a fractal, it won't. This leads us to fascinating results like finite shapes with infinite perimeter, sets with infinitely many points but no measure, and beautiful backgrounds that even people outside of math can enjoy. These fractals have existed in our universe since the beginning of time, but it wasn't until 1975 when Benoit Mandelbrot, the guy this is named after, coined the term fractal. Fractal. But to get to the root of identifying these objects, we need to head back 60 more years to World War I Germany. In 1914, German mathematician Felix Hausdorff released his seminal book titled Grundzüge der Mengenlehre, which is commonly regarded as the first text on point set topology. The book contained the first axiomatic definition for a topological space, and many other definitions which solidified him as a founding father of topology. So how's this related to fractals? Well, when looking at an object, we can define it through a set. A sphere can be represented by a set of points, same with a circle and even a line. From here, it's easy to categorize these sets into what's known as a topological dimension. This is the number of coordinates needed to specify the position of a point in space and the definition of dimension we're all familiar with. But fractals feel a little out of place here. They don't take up area like a shape does, but they require two planes to be represented. So they kind of fit somewhere in between. And come the end of World War I, Hausdorff thought the same. He devised another way to describe an object's dimension as how many copies it takes to multiply its size. To scale a square by a factor of two, it takes four copies, or two to the power of two. To scale it by a factor of three, we require nine copies, or three to the power of two. Setting out the equation seen here, we get the dimension of a square is two. We can also do the same with a triangle. Two times the size requires four copies, and four times the size requires 16. 
But what about a fractal? Well, consider Sapinski's triangle, an equilateral triangle with a gap of a triangle repeated infinitely. To double its size, we required two extra copies, or three total copies. This is still the same shape, just scaled by a factor of two, but Hang on, if I put 2 to the power of 2, I get 4, but all I need is 3 copies. So what's the dimension? Well, setting our exponent to be x, we can take the logarithm of each side, perform a bit of algebra, and find the dimension of Sapinski's triangle is 1.585, which last time I checked is not an integer. And this is known as its Hausdorff dimension, which describes the complexity or roughness of a shape. Shapes which are defined by traditional geometry and science have an integer dimension, in agreement with their topological dimension, and fractals can lie in between. This allows us to distinguish the fact that fractals are more than just a line, but not quite an area. Now, I would like to state there are other types of fractal dimensions, like the box counting dimension and the correlation dimension, but the house Hausdorff dimension is the most widely accepted and used, plus it's very intuitive. A line has dimension 1, a Koch snowflake has dimension 1.26, Sapinski's triangle has 1.63, Sapinski's carpet has 1.89, and a square has dimension 2, all of which look more filled in than the last. This makes so much sense, a Koch snowflake feels so much closer to a line than a plane, but Sapinski's carpet feels so much closer to a plane than a line. But what about fractals which feel exactly like a shape? Well, it's not necessary for a fractal to lie between dimensions, in fact we find a lot of fractals have an integer dimension. Take a look at this dragon curve. This is a self-similar fractal which eventually fills up a given space. We can think of these examples as mappings from one-dimensional space to two-dimensional space. We're essentially telling a line how to be a shape. These are known as space-filling curves because when you take their limit, they actually fill in the space. And we can find many fractals with this same property, even ones in three-dimensional space. And while these are cool, I'd like to look at a more interesting example being Sapinski's tetrahedral. Tetrahedron. This follows the same pattern we saw before, just using 3D tetrahedrons instead of 2D triangles. Using our idea of the Hausdorff dimension, we see that to scale this shape up by 2, we need exactly 4 copies of it. And if that sounds familiar, it should! This 3D looking fractal has a Hausdorff dimension of exactly 2! What? This 3D looking object made from one dimensional lines somehow makes its way to be perfectly two dimensional. But how? With these other 2D fractals, it intuitively makes sense. The lines get closer and closer to the point they completely fill in space. But with this one, they don't. Or do they? If we look at the tetrahedron from certain angles, we can see its projection onto a 2D plane appears to be a filled in square. And it's not the only fractal we can do this with. We can see that there are plenty of fractals with integer dimensions. It's just that some are more obvious than others. Now, going back to our original question, how long is the coastline of Britain? Knowing its fractal-like nature, it's actually better to ask, what dimension is the coastline of Britain? And the answer is 1.25. Now, there are many limitations to this statement because physical limitations exist. Even if you were to go down to a subatomic level and look at the distance between quarks, you'll end up with an absurdly large, but nonetheless finite value. But with these considerations aside, it's a pretty cool way to think about what lies between dimensions.